Hello, Higher Biology. This is Unit 1, Subunit 3, Gene Expression. It's a biggie, so be prepared. Okay, if you're in class, we would be doing a, a starter, so you'd be thinking about what is a phenotype and what have genes got to do with phenotype? You'd be thinking about this from your Nat 5 knowledge. So although you, you can pause it if you like, have a little think just now. Pretend I'm doing the register and all that stuff. Um, right, so um, the the lesson really is about, or it would be several lessons if we were in school, is about how a section of DNA, a gene, can be turned into a protein. And we'll be looking at things like what determines your phenotype, what does gene expression mean, it's the name of this same um, unit, what are the differences between DNA and something called RNA that you don't really know very much about yet? You're going to be able to name and describe three types of RNA. You are going to be able to describe three different processes, transcription, splicing and translation. Now they're the real biggies of this unit. And then lastly, you'll be able to explain how can you get more than one protein made from only one gene. Right, there's lots in this, take your time. Right, so from previous learning then, you should be able to fill in those blanks, no bother. So I'll just give you a wee second to read them. You can pause it if you like. So the what sequence of DNA is a genetic code? It is obviously the base sequence of the DNA that actually determines the genetic code. A section of DNA is a gene, and genes code for proteins, and proteins are made of amino acids, right? That's all national five. So what's coming up then? Well, we need to know how do you go from a section of DNA, a gene, from that we need to make a protein, which you know is made of amino acids, right? So we need to go from a bit of DNA into a chain of amino acids, basically, how on earth does that happen? Now in National 5, you do a tiny little bit on it. You need to know the real, the real detail now. So basically this dotted arrow represents gene expression, this entire unit. Right, so back to the starter question saying, so what is a phenotype? You may have remembered it as, um, a phenotype is the physical appearance of an organism. Um, so it's the, it's the particular characteristics that we can see in an individual. That's their phenotype. And what have genes got to do with phenotype then? What have genes got to do with your characteristics? Well, your genes are controlling what characteristics are displayed. The phenotype, your phenotype, any organism's phenotype is determined by the proteins that are made in a cell and the proteins are made using code from the DNA. So this, what have genes got to do with phenotype is really, the answer to that is sort of summarizes what gene expression is all about. So when a gene is expressed, the, the order of bases, the section of DNA, that code is turned into a protein. It's allowed to express itself. You think of other sentences that we use express you know we'd say um oh somebody expressed their feelings on that they made their feelings known so the gene is allowed to make its protein make the protein that it carries the code for all right so this is just to check you were listening for that last one what does it mean when we say a gene is expressed so make up an answer in your head have you got the right idea so a gene is expressed when the base sequence of the gene, you could see it's red, it's converted, it's turned into a protein. And what's important to remember here is actually only a fraction of the genes in a cell are actually expressed. So there's a lot of genes in a cell that are never converted into a protein, right? The gene never gets to do its stuff. It never gets to express itself. It never gets turned into a protein. And there's a couple of funny little biology jokes because in biology we love a joke and we love a song. Okay. 
Okay, so we're starting then with a the gene. We're starting with a section of DNA, and in eukaryotic cells, you know that they are found in the nucleus. Okay, so we've got a nucleus. Here we've got a chromosome, which we would find in the nucleus. If we looked really closely, we would find it's made of DNA, and we know that a gene is a section of DNA. This is just a couple of revision questions coming up. So name and spell correctly the bases present in DNA. This is a bit of revision from the last topic, the topic before that. So scribble them down on a bit of paper, spell them in your head. Adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine. You'll be fed up here in those. How can only four bases make such a huge number of different proteins in organisms? So we've only got these four choices. So how on earth can we get all the different types of protein that make all the different characteristics that all the different organisms have on earth? Well, every gene is incredibly long. It's telling us here the typical human gene is about 27,000 base pairs long. They're all different, but that's just sort of a rough idea to give you an idea of how, how many base pairs are in a gene. So we've got lots of different combinations then that we could arrange the A, the T, the C, the G in to make different codes, different genes to make different proteins. And then the last one is, does the gene, the section of DNA, leave the nucleus to make the protein that it codes for? And from that five, you should know that the answer is no. The DNA never leaves the nucleus. Okay, so think back to Nat5 again, where are proteins made? Shout at your screen, they're made on the ribosomes. And where do we find ribosomes? They're in the cytoplasm, right? They're certainly not in the nucleus. Okay, so we're saying DNA, section of DNA, a gene, can't leave the nucleus but it holds the code to make a protein, but the proteins have to be made outside the nucleus. So you've got the information inside the nucleus, but the actual production of the protein has to happen outside the nucleus. So how can that be? And you're thinking, what do I know from Nat5? What do I know from Nat5? I know the answer, it is mRNA. So you did know about this in mRNA, or you should have known about it, sorry, in Nat5. Right, mRNA. And there is a yet another joke. So hopefully you remember that the M stands for messenger. Messenger RNA. Okay. So this whole unit is called gene expression. And the first part of gene expression is called transcription. So there's really three main parts, transcription, splicing, and translation. So I've put a slide up like this um, at the start of each one so that when you're maybe going back to look at the video and you particularly want to look at one of those sections, hopefully you'll be able to find it because I'm leaving it up for quite a long time. So as you're kind of you know, going quickly through the, the YouTube video, you'll be able to find it. So I think that's probably long enough. Right, so in order to make a new protein, copy of the genetic code, the DNA, one gene, must be taken from the nucleus and passed to the site of protein synthesis. And the copy is made and transported using this mRNA, so the M is for messenger. So here we've got a really simple diagram. So this is our, if this was our cell membrane and the yellow bit's the nucleus, and this bit here's our DNA, and then this red bit is just a little copy of a section of the DNA, of a gene's worth of the DNA. This little red copy has been made. And that red copy that we're calling mRNA, it can leave the nucleus and go to the ribosome. Right? Remember, the DNA doesn't, it never leaves the nucleus. So a little copy has got to get made. We call that copy mRNA, and it's the mRNA that can leave the nucleus and join to a ribosome because it's on a ribosome where proteins are made. Okay, now this little blue arrow here, this moment when 
a section of DNA, a gene, is copied into mRNA, that process is called transcription. And it's the first stage of gene expression. So this is a different diagram showing transcription. So this is one strand of DNA, and this one here is our second strand of DNA. So you can see the DNA looks like it's, it's separated a little bit, a bit like what happens when DNA is replicating. So it can, the, di the diagrams can look similar. And for that reason, it's really important that you don't get muddled up between the two. And all this diagram is showing is this is our mRNA. So we're not making a copy of DNA like we did in the last unit. Only a little section is separating. So this bit here is not separating, and this bit here is not separating, just a section. And a copy has been made of one of the sides of the DNA. And that copy, you can see it's tiny there, it's called mRNA. Also in this nucleus, you can see there are free nucleotides. Now, we're used to hearing about free DNA nucleotides. This time, these are called free RNA nucleotides. But they behave in a similar way where if that had been a C, it would be a G that would want to, to bind to that. We'll get into the more detail a bit later. Right, here we've got an, a different diagram showing DNA and RNA. So here we've got our double strand of DNA, and you can see it's, it's together here and it's together here, but it's separated at this section. And this red or pink, depending on your screen, is our RNA, our mRNA. And this is just a bit, a bit further down the line. It's, we've got a bit more of it. So all I want you to do is sort of look at what, what differences do you notice between DNA and RNA in this diagram here. So you can pause the video and have a little look. So hopefully you notice that the blue, the DNA, is double-stranded, whereas the RNA is single-stranded. Right? This is just one strand, whereas DNA had two side by side. And the other thing that hopefully you noticed is Oops, where DNA, oh for goodness sake, where DNA has thymine, the T's, RNA seems to have something else, a U, which is, stands for uracil. So where our, our DNA, say TAC, for example, our, our RNA, because that was a T, here we've got an A because we know the A's and T's like to go together. Because that one's a C, we've got a G here because C's and G's like to go together. But this one's different. It's an A there and we would expect that to be a T. It was a T, look, when it was DNA. But RNA doesn't have thymine. It has uracil instead. And there's, there's another difference that you need to be aware of, okay? So differences in between DNA and RNA. They're similar, they're really similar, but there are key um, differences between the two. So we know that DNA is always double-stranded. We now know, you can see on the diagram, that RNA is single-stranded. We could see from the diagram that we know DNA has got guanine, cytosine, adenine, and thymine. RNA has got the first three the same, but instead of thymine, it has uracil. And we just re use a, a U to represent that, capital U. We know that the DNA is made of, of nucleotides. RNA is made up of very similar nucleotides. We've already said that the base on RNA is a U instead of, sort of replaces what would have been a T. So here we've got a T at the end here, we've got a U here. But the other difference that you couldn't tell from that previous diagram is the sugar that's in DNA is called deoxyribose sugar. The sugar in RNA, although it's drawn exactly the same as far as we're concerned, because we're not going into the, the real nitty gritty chemistry of it, it's called a ribose sugar. And that's why it's called RNA. So we've got deoxyribonucleic acid for, after the deoxyribose sugar. And we've got ribonucleic acid after the ribose sugar, which is why we're RNA here and it's DNA here. So that was 
three different structural differences between DNA and RNA. There are actually three types of RNA. So you've got messenger RNA, gets a little m for messenger. Transfer RNA gets a little t for transfer, and ribosomal RNA gets a little r. You guessed it for ribosomal. Well, our RNAs, no, you don't really need to know much about it. You just need to know that the ribosome itself is actually made of our RNA and protein. So all you could get asked about that is, <clears throat> what's RNA? What does RNA do? Oh, it makes up the ribosome along with some proteins. These two you need to know more about. So mRNA, you know already know a bit from Nat5, carries a copy of the DNA code from the nucleus to the ribosome. So it carries a message. So you can see how it gets its name, messenger RNA. Transfer RNA will come to a bit later on. Okay, so still just using Nat5 information. Using this diagram, and we can see that this little strand of mRNA has been made here, and we can see that this is our temp DNA template. Then this white section must be <coughs> the nucleus, and this process that's been shown here must be transcription. This yellowy area outside the nucleus must be the cytoplasm, and this thing here, so they're quite often drawn in this sort of shape as a ribosome. Okay. Right, we're going to look now at transcription in detail. Now, there's a warning here. There are similarities between transcription and DNA replication, but they are very different. Do not get them confused. I'll point out the differences in a couple of slides' time, but just be really clear in your head. So, you need to know DNA replication really confidently so that when you come to look at this next bit, you don't get numbered. Transcription. So this is this is the big blurb for the wordy people. The diagram will come in a wee minute. So we've got this thing here called RNA polymerase. And you've heard of DNA polymerase when we were doing DNA replication. But we're not trying to replicate DNA. We don't want any more DNA. We just want to make a copy of the DNA. And because the copy we make is made of RNA nucleotides, the enzyme that helps in this process is called RNA polymerase. So the start seems very similar to DNA replication, that the DNA is unwinding and unzipping. But instead of whole big um, section of DNA doing this, it's only going to be the gene. Right? It's, we're not trying to replicate the entire chromosome, we're only looking at um, a little section of the DNA, a gene's worth of DNA. And it's the same thing, how does it unzip? Well, the hydrogen bonds have to break. Then we have free mRNA nucleotides joined with complementary nucleotides on the DNA. So we know the complementary rule for DNA, and it's almost the same, but we know that if there had been an A on DNA, instead of the usual T, because we're talking about mRNA, it's going to be a U. And that, again, is controlled by RNA polymerase. This bit similar, weak hydrogen bonds form between base pairs. That's the same as the DNA replication story. Strong chemical bonds form between the sugar of one RNA nucleotide and phosphate of the next. That's the same as the DNA replication story. This bit's different. We do not want to leave this new piece of RNA that we've made in the nucleus. It's making a copy of the code, but then it wants to get out of there. So the weak hydrogen bonds break, which allows the mRNA to peel off the DNA, to pull away from the DNA. And that molecule is called the primary mRNA transcript. Primary meaning first. So your primary school was the first school you went to. The primary mRNA transcript is the first transcript that's made. Transcript just meaning copy. So it's the first copy that's made of the DNA.
Okay, so this diagram, or these two diagrams are showing the same thing. It's just good to see different versions of the same thing from different illustrators' minds. So in this case, this yellow thing here is the RNA polymerase. In this case, it's a lot bigger. The person's drawn it, this purple blob RNA polymerase. We've got a big long strand of DNA here, but it's only separated at a section at a gene's worth. And the same here. It's still twisted up at this side. It's still twisted up at this side. It's just a section's worth that's separated. And we've got our mRNA forming here. So because that was a T on the DNA, we get an A because we know that A's and T's go together. Because there's an A here, we've got a U. Now, if we were making DNA, it would be a T, but we're making RNA, so it's going to be a U because there is no T. It's because that's a C, that's a G, that's a C, that's a G, and so on. This diagram doesn't show the bases. Um, it's just showing our, M, our messenger RNA, our mRNA being formed and our RNA polymerase is doing its job. This is another diagram showing the same thing. We've got our DNA and it's still all intact in its double helix at this side. It's still in its double helix at this side, but it's separated out at a section at a gene. And here we've got our DNA template strand, our base sequence here, and the RNA nucleotides are coming in and matching up to the complementary bases and forming this RNA transcript, this copy. And again, we've got RNA polymerase looking like a bunch of bubbles there, doing its job. Right, this is just so you can see the comparison between DNA replication and transcription. The first thing to point out is the enzyme. So we've already said, we know that it's DNA polymerase, if we want to make more DNA, but it's RNA polymerase if we want to make RNA. But there's another difference. Here, DNA polymerase does one job. It uh, joins the complementary DNA nucleotides to the template. There is an enzyme that does this for DNA replication, but you do not need to know the name of it. If you watched the Amoeba Sisters video, which I hope you did, it does tell you the name of it, but you don't need to remember it for, for this course. However, in transcription, RNA polymerase does two jobs. It does the unwinding and unzipping. It does that very first stage. And it also joins the free RNA nucleotides. Okay, so... DNA polymerase, think of it as only doing one thing for DNA replication, whereas RNA polymerase, you need to think of it as doing two things here. Um, the second or another big difference is once you've made your, your new DNA here, that's, that's the end of it. it. Twists back up and it stays in the nucleus. Once we've made our RNA here, that RNA has to pull away from the DNA and escape the nucleus. So we've got this extra bit at the bottom, the hydrogen bonds that did form so that the correct bases would come in at the correct, sorry, the correct nucleotides would come in at the correct time. They need to, to break so that the mRNA can peel away from the DNA. And that transcript, that copy, remember we call the primary mRNA transcript. Right, so Sometimes you get questions where you've just got to work out what would the what would the bases be. Now, obviously, you're not going to memorise any base sequences. You just use the base pair and rule. So if this was DNA strand one, and this was to be the second strand of DNA, and you were then so you were to complete that, and then you were to complete what would the mRNA be that would copy from the second strand, you should be able to do that. Now, the yellow circles are there just to and make you think carefully about those ones, right? So you could get a scrap bit of paper and just scribble it down just now. Pause the video. So the second strand should look like that. And then the transcript, the copy that the RNA would take would look like that. And obviously the reason that these yellow dots were there was to make you think, oh, hold on, A, I'm thinking T, but because this is RNA, there ain't no T, 
I'll need to make it you instead. Okay, so we're moving on now to um, RNA splicing, which is the second sort of big thing to happen in gene expression. So I'm just going to leave that up, as I say, just so that when you're fast forward and through the video, you can find this section easily. Right, some of the primary mRNA transcript that's been made, so back to this other diagram we're looking at, some of that is actually what we call non-coding. It doesn't hold um, the code for making a protein. There's little bits of it that are, that they're not any good, right? We don't need them, they're non-coding. And so those non-coding bits need to get chopped out. And then the bits that are left, the bits that we want, the useful bits, need to get glued together. Okay, So some of this bit here, that's just been made inside the nucleus, is actually going to get chopped away. This is just another diagram. So here we've got our DNA, and here we've got our primary transcript. And we can see here that it split this DNA, or it split this transcript into exons and introns. Now, the exons, we have to think about being the excellent bits. We want the exons. The introns are the bits we don't want. They're the non-coding bits. They need to get removed. This process is called RNA splicing because to splice means to join or connect. So what we're doing is we're, we're taking the introns out. And as you can see, this diagram shows the exons, the excellent exons, are getting glued together. And another important thing to, to notice is the order of them hasn't changed. It's still the dark blue, the green, the red, the light blue, the orange, just like it was before. All we've done is taken out the introns, removed them completely and squished together the bits that we wanted, the excellent exons. And you can see from this diagram that once that's happened, this mRNA that we're left with is called the mature mRNA transcript. Right, so it's matured now, it's grown up a bit. So we're primary as the first one, and now we are called the mature mRNA transcript. Here we've got splicing in words. So introns, the non-coding bits are removed. Exons, which are the coding regions, are retained. So retained, just kept. The exons are spliced together, and we know that that word splice means to join or connect, and that makes the mature mRNA transcript. And it's this mature transcript that then leaves the nucleus and goes to the cytoplasm where it finds our ribosome. Here is just a different diagram showing splicing. This information is just the same. It's just to show you a different diagram. This diagram's kept in the, the introns, so the excised introns. That just means introns that were chopped away. That's just them hanging about, but they're not going to be used anymore. There's something else to notice here. Um, sometimes the mature transcript is called the functional transcript because that's the one that really forms the function. It's, it's the useful one. It depends what you look at. If you're looking at scholar it might refer to as functional if you're just watching other videos or looking at other websites it might it might call it functional so i've just told you that that exists so it doesn't confuse you okay so if this was transcription so this is our piece of mrna being transcribed taking a copy of the dna code in the nucleus using this rna polymerase then what would, we, what would be produced from that might be this. To start with, our primary mRNA transcript. But we know that splicing has to happen. There'll be bits of that that are not required. They're, they're, they're useless. We want rid of them. And those bits that we want to remove are called the introns. And if you compare the code of this to the code of that, you can work out what bits of this were the introns because we say, well, everything's the same, it's X, 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 it says A, U, G, G, A, U, G, G, and then we hit a change. 
there's two G's there and then an E. There's two G's there and then a G-U-E. And you can work out that that and that and that must have been introns because they didn't make it into the mature mRNA transcript. They were chopped out, chucked away, no good. And what we're left with were the exons spliced together. And it's this mature mRNA transcript that will then leave the nucleus and find a ribosome. So if we kind of zoom back out a bit and look at the whole cell. So this is a cell, with the, the, the blue, with the darker blue is the nucleus. We've got our DNA and a copy of the gene taken from the DNA, and that's called transcription. And that, that's what we call our, our primary transcript. Splicing then happens, and it's shorter because we've removed some of the, the, the or all of the non-coding regions, and it then leaves the nucleus. So we haven't done anything yet. We don't know what's going on here yet. We've only done the nucleus bit. So you might like to, at this point, stop, pause, have a cup of tea, and see if you can just make your own notes. Use this as a kind of um, a scaffold and I'll see if you can sort of make any extra notes. Maybe you could label this one and label this one and explain what's happening in splice and explain what's happening in transcription. And just see if you've managed to learn any of the bits we've looked at so far. Right, we're now moving on to translation, which is the sort of third of the, the big parts of gene expression. So like before, I'll leave that up for a wee bit. I think that's long enough. Okay, so remember this topic is all about gene expression, which is taking the code from a gene and making a protein using that code. But so far, all we've got is a little strand of mRNA. We haven't got a protein at all. And if I ask you what our protein's made of, which you were asked at the beginning, you're all going, for goodness sake, we're not idiots. Proteins are made of amino acids. So we're just going to look a little bit at amino acids first before we sort of look at this final translation stage. So amino acids, what do we know? Well, you may or may not know this, remember this, or ever been told this, but I'm telling you now. Amino acids are made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, right? Just, you might be interested in that if you do chemistry. There are 20 different types of amino acids. And the amino acids, when they make a protein, are joined together by peptide bonds. Hopefully you remember that from last year. And a chain of amino acids we call a polypeptide chain. We don't call it a protein straight away. So we see lots of amino acids joined together by peptide bonds to make polypeptide chains. Poly meaning many. We, we spoke about that in the DNA replication video. And the, the order that the amino acids are joined in is really important because it determines what shape is the protein going to have and therefore what function is the protein going to play. Is it going to be um, the protein that makes up your hair or is it going to be the protein that makes up amylase or is it going to be the protein that makes up um, a different enzyme like catalase or what, what is that protein going to become that is determined by the order that the amino acids are joined together in so it's very important that when a protein is made the order of amino acids is correct this is just shown a polypeptide chain so every little coloured circle is representing an amino acid. Here is just a close-up, this is just a, a magnified section, and you can see that there's three letters in each circle, and that's really just the abbreviation for the name of the amino acid. So underneath here we've got the 20 different amino acids, and the abbreviation that they're given, you do not need to remember these. Breathe a sigh of relief. You might get given some, they might, they might call them by their real names in a question, but you don't need to memorize them. Okay, so imagine this was polypeptide chain one, polypeptide chain two. We can see that there are um, differences. 
Okay. Now, you don't need to know what this ala means. It's just a type of amino acid, as is arg and his and pro and mate. But you can see that there are differences. So they both start with the ala, but then look, that's different. Then we've both got this one the same. That's different. That's the same. That's the same. They're different. And they're the same. But because those amino acids are different, that polypeptide chain will behave in a different way to this polypeptide chain. It will fold differently, it will become a different shape, and it will perform a different function. So the order that these amino acids line up in when a protein has been made is crucial. It must be the correct order in order to make the correct protein. Now, depending on the diagram you look at, different amino acids can be represented. They might use colours, like that last one did. So it might, you know, you might just get a purple circle that represents a particular one of the 20 amino acids, or they might make it a shape, or they might just give it its, its um, abbreviation. Now, so all of these things could represent the amino acid called serine. That's really what it's like if you are interested, but you certainly don't need to memorise that. But for those people that are interested, there you go. There's 20 different amino acids that exist with their abbreviated form and really what is their chemical structure. But again, don't, don't worry about that. Just zoom straight past this slide if it's stressing you out. Okay, so if we think we would got to, we were at the stage where the mature mRNA transcript was leaving the nucleus and joining to a ribosome. But we need to get from this to this. We need to get a chain of amino acids. But so far, all we've got is this bit of mRNA that's made up of RNA nucleotides. If we look at this um, sort of summary diagram here, we've got uh, transcription, which we know all about now that goes on inside the nucleus. And then we've got splicing that's not shown on this diagram. And then it leaves. And here we've got um, the structure that the the mRNA has joined to. And oops, hopefully you can remember because it wasn't that long ago when we asked it before, that proteins are made on ribosomes. So that's where this, this third stage, this translation is happening at a ribosome. Now, if you think about the word translation, normally you would talk about a language being translated into a, a different language. So it's just the same. So we've got the language of nucleotides or the language of bases. We've got our A's and our U's and our C's and our G's here getting translated into a different language, getting translated into an order of amino acids. So it's transcription first, splicing in the middle, this diagram doesn't show, and then translation. So what's going on then? So remember we had three types of RNA. We had our messenger, which we know all about now. We've got, we had our RNA, our RNA, sorry, which makes up the ribosome. But the one we're interested in now is tRNA, transfer RNA. And transfer RNA has a particular job, which is to carry or take a specific amino acid from the cytoplasm to the ribosome. So it transfers the amino acids where they're needed, when they're needed. Right, so what does it look like? Well, you could tell from the last diagram it was this weird shape. So that there is one tRNA molecule. Now it's RNA, so it's single-stranded. So it starts here, does this weird funny shape, does this weird funny little look, ooh, little bubble there, blah, 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 blah. But it's still single-stranded. And all that's the reason that it takes this shape is these are little hydrogen bonds that make it fold up in that particular way. Now, they might draw it like that, or they might draw it in a different way, but there are important parts to look out for. So this bit here isn't part of the tRNA. This is, an, this is our mRNA. But the reason that it's drawn underneath it is three bases here, G, A, G, is linking up with three bases here, C, U, C. So often, tRNA is drawn right beside mRNA, but you need to realise that that alone is the tRNA molecule. So let's find out a little bit more about it. 
So tRNA, transfer RNA. So you find it in the cytoplasm. And it's a single strand, like I've said before, folded in a particular way. So there we've got one tRNA molecule, and that's just it, just, you know, looking at one a bit more um, closely. At the bottom, we've still got those three bases that we had on the previous diagram. These three bases here. We've still got those, and they're still the same there. Now, these three are really important. Right, so it folds in a way that forms an anticodon site. So these three bases that we spoke about before, they're red on this diagram. That's called an anticodon. So three bases in a row on tRNA is called an anticodon. And the anticodon correlates with the amino acid that the tRNA will attach to. So on this diagram here, you can see, maybe it's quite small, that there's three green bases in a row. And these three green bases in a row are called a codon. So those three bases there, on the mRNA is a codon, on the red is called, on the tRNA it's called the anticodon. Now this will become more obvious when we look at the next few diagrams. tRNA will carry an amino acid to the ribosome, we'll come to that, and there are many different types of tRNA in a cell, one or more for each amino acid. I'll come to that as well. So this is just that same diagram, but bigger. So again, this one's shown it in that funny little shape it is. But what's important is this bit here, which is called the amino acid attachment site. And there we've got an amino acid actually attached. And this bit here, which this diagram's calling it the anticodon loop, but the three bases in a row is called the anticodon. And then the three bases on the mRNA is called a codon. We'll look at another diagram. Right, so here we've got the amino acid attachment site. In this case, there's no amino acid attached at this point. So sometimes there'll be an amino acid attached and sometimes there won't. It depends on what stage the tRNA is at. Here we've got our anticodon, three bases in a row on tRNA. Here we've got our codon, three bases in a row on mRNA. Now, sometimes the anticodon and the codon are called triplets, a triplet of bases. Now, tri, you know, means three. You know of triangles and tricycles and triceratops and triath uh, triathlons. So the triplet is just three bases, just a fancy way of saying three bases. Now, this, this mRNA at this particular point has GAG. Now, because that's GAG, the tRNA that's hanging about in the cytoplasm, waiting for a job to do, the one that's got CUC is going to be the one that clicks in place there because CUC is complementary to GAG. So if you remember that for the next little bit. Here is an example of four different types of tRNA. Now again, you don't need to memorize what type, what amino acid goes with what anticodon. It's just to try and um, illustrate the, the fact that there's different tRNA molecules because what differs is the anticodon. So if you get one with an anticodon GCG, it will always carry this amino acid with it. If you have a tRNA molecule that has UCU as an, sorry, UCG as an anticodon, it will always carry this particular amino acid on it. And the same goes for this and the same goes for this. Right, so there are there are lots of different types of tRNA molecule. There are more than 20 because this amino acid, for example, arginine, might be carried by GCG, but it also might be carried by other anticodons. But don't worry about that. Right, so back to this diagram that you looked at before. So if this was the DNA um, code on strand one, on strand two, and then this was the mRNA code that you worked out would, would be made from a, by making a, taking a copy of that. You can then work out, well, what will the tRNA molecules be that would like to, to base pair with these? And the reason these wee brackets are here is because we know that it's three, it's a triplet that's important. So the green ones, the green little brackets are representing codons, and the blue ones, 
on the tRNA are representing anticodons. So if you pause the video and just work out what would the anticodons be that would like to bind with these codons. And now you've worked it out. Oops. It will be that. Remembering, because we're talking about RNA, there will be no Ts. There will be Us instead. Right, this diagram is showing translation. So we're starting with the diagrams and then we'll do the words. So here we've got our mature mRNA transcript that left the nucleus and attached to a ribosome. So that's what this teal, let's call it teal colour ribosome. And there's our three bases in a row called a codon. And these funny goldy coloured things are our transfer RNA molecules. So this diagram shows three of them, right, tRNA. And there we've got a UCA is an anticodon on that particular tRNA molecule. There we've got another anticodon. Here we've got another anticodon. Now you can see, if we do it in the order it would happen, obviously the, the mRNA comes first. It was made in the nucleus, came out and joined our ribosome. Then the tRNA molecules start to do their job. So this tRNA molecule had come in and it had clicked in place here because that was AGU. And this tRNA molecule has UCA. It wanted to bind because of the complementary bases to this place here. So it did that. And because UCA always brings with it a particular amino acid, there would have been this green amino acid sitting on top there. And that would be fine. And it would just hang about and wait. And then this transfer RNA molecule would come in. And the reason that this particular one is coming is because that's CGU. And it's got GCA, which is complementary. The anticodon fits the codon. And because that's GCA, it always brings with it this purple amino acid. And if we sort of rewind back a bit of time in our imagination, that would mean the green and the purple were side by side. And because they were side by side, a bond formed, a peptide bond formed between the two amino acids. Now, once that's happened, this is attached to this, which is attached to this, which is bound to this, which is attached to the ribosome. So it's not going anywhere. So this transfer RNA molecule has done its job. It dropped the green amino acid off at the right place, at the right time, and it, it formed a bond with the purple one. So this transfer RNA molecule can now leave, it can break its hydrogen bonds here, and it can leave, fly away into the cytoplasm, feeling very pleased with itself, and go and find another green amino acid to pick up. Because maybe we need another green amino acid further down the line. We then go forward in time a little bit and this transfer RNA molecule comes along. And because that's ACG, it will be the one that's complementary. So it's anticodon is UGC. And UGC always brings with it the blue amino acid. So we've got the green one and the purple one. And the blue ones now come along to join the party. Now because that's right beside this, a peptide bond will form between those two. And then if we fast forward beyond this diagram, we can imagine that this transfer RNA molecule has now done its job. It dropped off the purple and the purple's in the right place between the green and the blue. It can go away and find another purple amino acid. And so the process continues until it's told to stop. You know how I like lots of diagrams to show the same thing. So same thing, our ribosome is a really yucky color this time. Here we've got our mature transcript here. Our transfer RNA molecules this time are looking more like Lego, but we've still got our anticodon here and our codons here and our amino acids are coming in and our peptide bonds are forming. This is calling it an incoming tRNA. So it's flying in, bringing with it its amino acid. This transfer RNA is outgoing. It's done its job. It can feel very pleased with itself. It drops its trip off at the right place at the right time and off it goes to find another one. And it continues 
so we have a growing peptide chain. Here's another diagram. Don't worry, I think this is the last. Um, this time they use nicer colours. So we've got our, our ribosome here in the background, this pale purpley bluey colour. We've got our codons. This is our mRNA. We know we would really call it our mature mRNA transcript. We've got our tRNA. We know that these are peptide bonds and another one would form there and we're all becoming very experimental. Oh no, there's one more, forgot about this one. This one's important because there's something on it that I've not mentioned yet, which is a start codon. So when the mRNA, the mature transcript, joins to a ribosome, there will be a very particular codon at the start, which is called a start codon. And that's how the ribosome knows to kind of get the process going and start start producing this polypeptide chain. So the whole process of translation begins or starts at a start codon, and wait for it, this is going to shock you, it stops at a stop codon. I know, great. For once they use words that actually make sense. So here we've got same thing, there's our transfer RNA, there's our our methionine, you do not need to know that is the name of amino, an amino acid. They'll tell you there's phenylalanine. Oh, they picked the big names this time. Here's another one coming in with lysine, and it's just showing exactly the same as all the other diagrams. Right, here's the wordy bit for you wordy people. So, remember we're at translation. We're out in the cytoplasm, joined to a ribosome. So, it's our mature mRNA transcript that we're talking about. And that thing that we just said about a start codon. So it starts at a start codon. We know this information about tRNA. tRNA collects a specific amino acid. We know that. We know that the anticodon correlates with the amino acid that it carries. tRNA carries the amino acid. Yep, we can see that in the diagrams. The anticodon pairs up with the codon. This is repeated for many tRNAs and amino acids are brought adjacent to each other. Now adjacent just means beside, right? So the amino acids are brought beside each other in the correct sequence. Peptide bonds form between the adjacent amino acids and you get a chain, a polypeptide chain, which lots of amino acids join together. And the thing that makes sense, it stops at a stop codon. Translation stops when a stop codon is reached. So here's just another diagram with some things to label. So if you have a look at it, pause it and see if you can work out what all the labels are. Okay, so these are our amino acids. Joining the amino acids together is our peptide bond. That section there must be our amino acid attachment site. Now at the moment these have all got amino acids attached to the attachment site that some diagrams show them empty. Three bases, our triplet of bases on our tRNA molecule is an anticodon. Three bases, a triplet of bases on mRNA is a codon. This bit here is showing them joined together. So the codon and the anticodon are actually joined by hydrogen bonds at this point. And this yellow thing, we presume, is the ribosome. And this is what we've said already. After a tRNA is dropped off its amino acid, it can... Dropped. Sorry, folks, I have to change that because it's really annoying me. It's wrong. Dropped off its amino acid, it can go and pick up another one ready for whenever it is required. This is just a diagram that is quite busy, but it's quite nice. So it, it sort of shows, not as much detail as we, we would like, but it sort of shows um, what we've kind of been looking at in gene expression. So we've got our nucleus here, our DNA, um, and then they're sort of showing you that the gene is just a section of the DNA. This is our mRNA being copied. This is the mRNA, sorry, mRNA being made, copying the DNA. mRNA leaving the nucleus, joining to a ribosome. These are our tRNAs. They're showing the three bases, the anticodon, joining with the codon. And then this 
polypeptide chain growing. It's also shown free amino acids, shown how our transfer RNA molecules, once they've dropped off one amino acid, they can leave and pick up another one. There's an awful lot of information to put on one diagram, which is why usually you're only getting a wee bit of the story. There is a process missing. There's one big bit that's been missed out of this diagram, so you can just have a little think to yourself what it is, and then say, yep, we're not idiots, Mrs. Dagger. It is splicing. This diagram hasn't shown any splicing. Okay, so we're on the home stretch now. So the final protein, um, we've done transcription, we've done splicing, we've done translation. We're now talking about how do we get from a polypeptide chain to a fully fledged protein? Okay, so like it says there, translation is not the end of the story, although we wish it was. The polypeptide chain needs to be processed. That just means some extra wee bits and bobs need to happen to it before it can become a functional protein. And a functional protein basically just means a protein that will be able to correctly perform its job, its function. So as just a, a, a straight chain of amino acids, that would not be functional. It wouldn't be in the right shape. It wouldn't be able to do its job. So extra bits and bobs, a wee bit of this, a wee bit of that, a wee bit of folding, a wee bit of twisting, a wee bit of bonding here and there has to happen before you get a functional protein. So if this was our chain of amino acids, so that's our polypeptide chain made up of a very particular sequence of amino acids that was determined by the sequence on the mRNA, which was determined by the sequence on the DNA. You can see here that instead of saying straight, it's kind of coiled up. So that's an example of something that might happen to a polypeptide chain. And really the only detail that you need to know for higher biology is that hydrogen bonds play a role in that. Hydrogen bonds play a role in everything so far, don't they? But hydrogen bonds play a role in, in allowing this chain to start to form a particular shape. And what might also happen is, quite often, a, a, a functional protein is often made of more than one chain. So we've looked at how one amino acid chain, one polypeptide chain is made. That might have to happen several times, and then they're combined together to make a functional protein. And remember, it's the shape of the protein that determines that the job the protein does. So the order of these amino acids was really important because it allowed it to fold and form in a particular way to make a functional protein to do a particular job. So if we think about, okay, so way back at the start it was gene expression is when a gene is pretty much turned into a protein. So if we just sort of try and summarize that into a few words, it's much easier to do it if we use this word determines. So the sequence of bases on DNA determines the sequence of bases that are going to be on the mRNA, because they take a copy of it, which determines the sequence of bases on the tRNA that are going to come and click into place, those that codon, anticodon stuff, which determines the sequence of amino acids, the order that the amino acids come in. And that order then determines the shape that the protein will make and therefore the function that the protein has. Oh, thank goodness, we're nearly there, we've got to have a deal. Okay, so this will be down as link one and then um, I'll post it somewhere for you. This one's quite good. Remember, if anything's mentioned in a video that is a term um, or a, a process that I've not mentioned, you don't need to know it. It's just, it's the best example I could find. Okay last little bit. So, so far, you've probably assumed that one gene codes for one protein, but that's not true. One gene can actually make different proteins. So we're thinking, well, you've just gone on and on and on about how the order of the DNA was really important because it determined this and determined that, determined this. So how can it make a different protein? So if we think about the whole process, this is our nucleus, we've got our DNA, copy into mRNA, 
splice in, so we get our mature RNA, leaves the nucleus, translation, we get our amino acid chain. What bit there, at, on, at what point there, could something different happen? which would result in a slightly different protein being made. You can pause and think. Okay, the answer is, I'll just go to this slide here, the answer is this stage, okay, the splicing. We can have something called alternative splicing. So alternative meaning different. So, if this was our primary transcript, we can see we've got one, two, three, four exons, four regions of coding um, RNA, but we've got three introns and they're going to be removed. This is just a very simple way of saying, well, sometimes you might keep one, two, three, and four exons together, or an alternative, a different way would be just to get rid of four as well and just have one, two, and three or get rid of three and just have one, two, and four. So some exons are treated almost like they were introns and they're taken away. And that is called alternative splicing, splicing it in a different way. There's something else that allows you to make more than um, one protein. Um, and it's down to something called post-translational modification. You don't need to know about it, but it might mention it in some things because it did used to be more important for you guys. So if we just look at the diagram again, so we've got our, our DNA transcription happens and we get our primary transcript, splicing happens and we get our mature, but that's the bit where we could end up with a, a different mature transcript if different exons are kept and spliced together. They then uh, leave the nucleus, and we get translation. Now, after tra th this bit here that we were speaking about, the bit with the, the extra sort of twisting and the folding and the different things happening, that's sometimes called post-translational modification. And it still does talk about that in some videos, I think in Scholar. So don't, um, don't worry about it, but it just means post means after. If you think about postnatal depression, depression after, after a baby's been born or post-war Britain, you know, uh, Britain after the war, if you're into your history. Modification, to modify something is just to change it. So this post-translational modification just means changes made after translation. Okay, just in case you do, you do come across it, don't, don't worry. Right, here's another um, animation, just a slightly different one. It might click in your head better than the other one give you an option, watch them both. And a song. It's called the DNA song. It starts off with DNA and then uh, moves on to how DNA is used for gene expression. So I've given you your fair share of biology jokes and I've also put in there a wee biology song. Okay, so if you can just have a little look back through that. We've covered all of these things. Remembering that this thing here, the transcription, the splicing, and the translation, they're the biggies. Uh, they're, the, they're the beasts of gene expression. You really need to know what's going on with these things here. And if you know those things inside out, you kind of already know the rest of it. Well done. Have a cup of tea. <laughs>